Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome into our latest and, and last installments of the spring 2022 Chalk Talk series here at uh, the Tisch Institute. Um, we're really excited to continue this uh, informal tradition that we started over a year and a half ago during the, the pandemic, uh, but it's been such a great learning opportunity to help connect our, our students and faculty with interesting people in the industry. Um, and it's been a great way to, to keep up on what our, our other colleagues are, are up to. Um, and so we're excited to finish it out this, uh, this semester here. My name is Dr. Ted Hayduck. Uh, with me, I have Stephen Coltai. Um, we have our, our third uh, panelist is hopefully joining us soon. His name is Sean Meredith, and, and I'll let him um, introduce himself if and when he can get here and get logged in okay. Uh, but in the interest of, of moving forward and being mindful of everybody's time, uh, we're gonna go ahead and start right now anyway. And then when Sean gets here, we can kind of weave him into the discussion. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the, or as you may have, might have read, uh, the topic today is gonna be a, a hodgepodge or a mix. We're gonna talk about esports and gaming. We're going to talk about uh, the entertainment landscape and the metaverse and Web 3.0. Uh, some of these are terms you're familiar with. Some of them are probably not terms you're familiar with. Uh, and so we're going to take the opportunity to chart this landscape that uh, that's really emerging before our eyes. I can't think of a time uh, even before, you know, a couple years ago, I don't think metaverse and Web 3 was part of the the uh, popular discourse. And so we're all kind of actively learning about it together. Uh, and so with that, um, I don't have to intro myself. I think I, I'm looking at the panel or the participants list here. And I think I know just about all of you and you all know me. Uh, so I'm gonna let Steven introduce himself and give a little bit of his background, talk about his experience in the entertainment industry and, and his experience as an entrepreneur, as an investor, in entrepreneurial endeavors uh, and all that good stuff. So Stephen, the um, floor is yours. Great, well, thank you, Ted, for, um, for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. There's um, several pieces to my background that are directly relevant to the conversation we're having today. So I'm gonna focus on those. I've, I've had a checkered past, so there are a lot of things that are not necessarily uh, directly relevant, but there are two parts, uh, as Ted mentioned, um, entrepreneurship and entertainment um, that are relevant. Um, the and and they have they, they've been woven together, uh, you know, in in my life. It's not like one happened and stopped, and then the other one started. They they've been sort of, uh, you know, co terminus and uh, simultaneous. But I I I spend about half of my working life in um, uh, the entertainment industry, of which the, the longest single part right. was, Thank you. Um, Bye. It was in um, at, at Warner Brothers, where I was head of corporate strategy and uh, development for a decade. And then um, I also spent some time in some entrepreneurial ventures in the sort of media and communications industry, particularly in, in satellite television. Um, uh, both on the on the entrepreneurial side, I co-founded a company that's uh, called SES, uh, which is based in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and is a cable television satellite company that distributes most of cable channels in Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East. Um, that was an entrepreneurial venture where I was partnered um, with with uh, a satellite engineer, and and then the time at Warner Brothers working on. Um, you know, at that time, and, and frankly, it's very relevant to today's conversation, the continuing evolution of, of the entertainment business from its, you know, its, its original roots, Warner Brothers um, was one of the, the first uh, uh, film studios uh, and was traditionally uh, one of the, the largest. Um, and I left Warner, I started Warner Brothers Interactive Entertainment as my last um, activity there because I felt that sort of digital media was going to overtake, um, you know, traditional uh, film and tape. Um, the content, 
you know, would continue, but the me method of delivery and the means would change. Of course, eventually both the, 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 the method of delivery started to dictate the content. And we're going to talk about that a lot more as we delve deeper into esports. But this, you know, interweaving of technology and entertainment, uh, uh, the content and the technology um, is, 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 is sort of the marquee the hallmark of this whole space. And um, I, I've worked with lots of startups uh, over time. Uh, and, 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 and most recently I've been, um, I, mo I moved from Los Angeles to Maine about 15 years ago, um, and been quite involved in the, in the startup ecosystem in, in, in Maine. Uh, I also uh, work at MIT and am involved in the startup ecosystem there, which is a, a, an extraordinary one, which um, is another one of the things that my, my colleague and partner, Sean, and I have in common, and you'll hear from him in a minute. But um, I was a mentor at Techstars, which is a big accelerator uh, incubator program nationwide um, for startups. And that's how I met um, this particular company, which is, which is so fascinating to me, Omnic, and which we're going to be talking about a lot today. So my background is on, this, on the startup side, but also on the entertainment side. I know almost nothing about esports, which is the main thing we're going to be talking about. And so for that, I want to um, introduce my, my, my friend and colleague, um, Sean Meredith, who's the co-founder of Omnic.ai. And if it's okay with you, Ted, maybe Sean can introduce himself and Omnic. Absolutely. Yeah, just uh, r right on time. Um, glad we could get Sean um, logged in okay and everything. So welcome. Thank you for, uh, for jumping in here. Um, hey, Matt, sorry for taking a little bit. It's not normally a technical problem I have. <laughs> <laughs> no, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, we're glad. We're glad to have you with us. So you know, Stephen uh, brings a wealth of knowledge um, at this intersection of you know technology, media, and entertainment. Um, within that world, right? You're working in esports, uh, but you you as well bring kind of a, a, um, a nice broad set of experiences to the table. So it'd be great if you could chat about your career expertise and experience and how that led you into Omnic. Sure, sure. Um, well, that's it. So I've had a very widely uh, just disparate kind of, I guess, career slash profile. So um, uh, at, as you know, Stephen kind of mentioned, um, my bachelor's degree is from MIT in fusion nuclear, nuclear engineering. So very different topic. <laughs> hey, right, right online with esports, right? <laughs> yep. yeah. Although we'll get back to this because it ties in kind of mm -hmm. weirdly, but it yeah. does. <laughs> and then um, I was in uh, the nuclear Navy as a submariner for uh, about six and a half years. And uh, from there, I went back to grad school at MIT and did my master's work in applied plasma physics and worked on a particular plasma, uh, a particular plasma physics experiment um, that one of the things that's kind of unique is with plasmas is they're very, very hot, as hot as the sun. And you can't just stick a thermometer in there and try to see, you know, what the temperature is and, and to try to infer what's going on is really difficult. So one of the things we wound up using were some computer vision techniques to analyze film or, you know, video streams of what the plasma was doing and try to predict what was going to happen with that plasma. All right. And um, then I did my uh, PhD research in uh uh, product design uh, in the mechanical engineering department and got bit hard by the startup bug and wound up doing a few different startups in the in the Boston area. Uh, a couple very successful, a couple that were just wrecks. And um, <laughs> what I tell people is you learn the most from the ones that were wrecks, but boy, is that painful. And you, you don't want to be there <laughs> if you can avoid it. <laughs> um, so now, um, uh, after doing that for a couple of years, I actually wound up uh, taking a job with Apple Computer, and we did uh, what is still the world's largest educational computing uh, technology initiative, where we rolled out a little over 70,000 computers to the 7th and 8th grade 
uh, students in Maine and all the teachers. We installed wireless networks. We set up a support network. We did, uh, you know, uh, backups and data centers and established a repair depot and taught kids how to repair computers. The whole, you know, the whole kind of enchilada around everything with that program. And that's where I met my co-founder, uh, Chuck Goldman. And he and I have stayed in touch over the years. And uh, we've always kind of said, hey, you know, we should do something together again. And um, what happened was, is just a couple of years ago, for those of you that know esports, uh, the Overwatch League started. And when the Overwatch League started, I noticed that was the first league that had more of a permanence attached to it than the traditional esports uh, kind of leagues at the time. Because at the time, they'd form these tournaments, teams would form, maybe play in a tournament, maybe two tournaments together, and then they kind of disbanded and, and went their own way. So, so individual players or esports athletes had their own followings, but teams didn't really have a following. And the Overwatch League set up that traditional franchise model uh, with, you know, local geographies and people bought into these teams. And um, they kept talking about having a combine and figuring out, you know, uh, how do we recruit players? Where do we get these players? You know, how do we go about this? And it never happened. And I kind of noticed that it didn't happen. You know, can they take just a few minutes of your time? And they said, sure, you know, um, and they were glad to discuss, you know, how they recruit players. Most of them it's, well, John gets on a plane, flies somewhere and comes back with a couple of players. <laughs> There's not real, there wasn't really a science to it. And, um, and I said, well, what about this combine? And they said, you know, that would have been a great idea, but we had no idea what to measure. And so that was the genesis for Omnic. And um, we started like looking at some academic papers, uh, finding some things to measure, and then started applying those same computer vision techniques to watching video of the gameplay. And with that, uh, talking to a few coaches, finding certain actionable moments that we could train the AI to look for. And then the AI could actually pick out some of those things and report back to you and let you know you were doing this well, or you were not doing this well. And from there, um, that's kind of where we're at now. We just did a big pre-launch event in LA with uh, NRG Esports. And uh, uh, right now we have uh, pre-launch signups are open at forge.omnic.ai. And um, we're looking forward to launching here in just about a month or so. I love it, I love it. Um... Such a broad, I mean, between the two of you, um, you know, such a broad range of skill sets brought to the table, you know. Um, what do you get when a Hollywood exec and a nuclear physicist and a professor <laughs> walk into a Zoom room, right? Like it's, yep. uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating and it's, uh, I'll take the opportunity to kind of like reiterate to like any of the students that might be watching how broad of a background you really can and probably should have trying to work in sports, right? It's not just the professional leagues anymore it's not just collegiate it's not just you know anything it's it's ever expanding uh, rapidly and there's all kinds of backgrounds that can lead you into this space so um i, I love i love hearing that and i love hearing all these different stories um, about how people wound up working in the industry um so this is wonderful and and sean uh you talked a little bit about you know the origin of, of omnic and um, gave us a little bit of insight, but I'm wondering if you can go a little bit more into a little bit more detail about what is the product, you know, what does it look and feel like, what's the experience like from a, from the standpoint of a player, um, and, sure. and what makes it, uh, sticky, right, in your mind? Yep, sure. Um, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because, uh, you know, uh, once again, to go into a little bit more detail, when we, when we first started, we really thought, kind of these professional teams or these professional athletes would be our market. And um, uh, what we rapidly learned is actually there's a far larger market out there, as you kind of mentioned, at all levels. There's, you know, the aspiring gamer. There's the gamer who wants to try to get on a collegiate team. There's the, you know, uh, college age player or maybe even a little younger that wants to be on a professional 
uh, team or a semi-professional team. And then there's also just people that want bragging rights with their friends and want to be just a little bit better than the, you know, three friends that I play with so that I, like that. I can say, Hey, you know, uh, check me out. Like, this is what I can do. And so with that, um, our original model was kind of much more of a professional services engagement with the team where we would go in and, and we would run the software kind of on the back end and then present them with reports. Right. Mm -hmm. And what we spent the last about six months doing is kind of altering that and making a web-based platform. And it's a freemium subscription as a service um, type offering. So anyone can use the, the base features that we have for free. Um, in fact, you can sign up, you can get a game analyzed and that's completely free. And if you share things out uh, and, and tell the world about your analysis or what you've learned, then you can get extra, uh, we call them ingots that you earn in the forge. And uh, with those ingots, you can then uh, get more match analyses or uh, upgrade your you know, kind of features on your card, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but basically what we do is we offer a post-match analysis. So, so you as a gamer, say, can, can either connect, connect your Twitch or YouTube gaming account, or you can upload a video of your gameplay. You can do e any of those. Um, but the simplest is if you connect like your Twitch account. And once you do that uh, and register for you know, what game you want analyzed, um, we are offering a, a handful of games kind of out, out of the gate that, that we do the analysis for. Um, but once you connect that in, we simply watch your stream. And after every match, you get a report. And you, you can get an email notification or a pop-up notification, whatever. It says, here's your report. You go and look at that report. You, the report includes a few different things. One is you get a nice digital uh, player card. So you look like a professional, your name and lights, you know, shows all your stats from that match. And likewise, you can share that out to your friends to say, hey, look at this, you know, um, I just, you know, got, you know, play the game, something like that, right? And then um, uh, likewise, we have a compare feature in the platform. So you can pick friends, rivals, or even professionals, and you can compare and see yourself head to head with how they play and look at you know, how your game styles match up against each other. Um, another element to that we call our play styles. And this one is more, much more of a serendipitous moment, but after you play a match, if the AI happens to recognize that you play like a particular professional player or with their play style, it will highlight that for you and say, hey, congratulations, you just played like super. You know, you might want to check out videos of his on Twitch or YouTube, and that way you can learn how your style, like, can get better, you know, similar to his. And then um, the two final features that we offer are, one is simply uh, we have custom reports and graphs and charts, so you can look through, you know, if you want to delve into your history or see, like, you know, what weapon do I perform the best with or, you know, uh, when I select this hero, what's my, you know, win loss percentage on this map, you know, things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, we also offer a, a highlight reel. And this is, this is kind of unique because what it does is it, the AI, when it detects certain elements of, in that match, it will clip those and present you with kind of a highlight reel, that same thing you can share out to your friends to say, Hey, check out all these, you know, um, sick heels that I just got, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's incredible. And, and to think just to reiterate and think here that all of this is, is automated through some pretty incredible tech on the back end is, um, is even more impressive, right? I think a lot of yep. folks, you know, can sit and, you know, get advice or coaching or feedback or whatever. You can really truly automate that. That's really special. And so uh, I want to pivot a little bit and just, I'm, I'm curious, you know, Stephen, so you're a, um, an advisor to Omnic and, and you met Sean through the Techstars program in Maine. Um, what was uh, immediately compelling to you about, um, about Omnic that, you know, really pulled you in? Can you recall that, um, that feature or that moment? 
Well, you know, I've been working with startups all over the world for a long time. Um, and one thing I, I have learned, and I loved what Sean said about, you know, we learn as much or more from our failures as our successes, because I certainly had plenty of those myself. And, 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 and what really drew, drew me to them and draws me to any startup is uh, the people, because um, almost always, by definition, um, you're going to have to pivot off of what were your original strategies and thoughts. And it really is, it becomes down to a question of, you know, does this person, or in the case of Sean and Chuck, this team, because they're co-founders, have the potential, are they coachable? Um, can they pivot? Um, are they so wedded to, you know, their view of the world that no market feedback or hard data that comes flying back at them will penetrate their view, in which case I'm out of here. So I think, you know, broadly, obviously, entertainment and technology as combined has been my passion for much of my career. So they were, you know, right church um, at, 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 to begin with, but then it was the right pew within the right church because here were two guys who frankly had had, had some battle scars, had done some other startups um, and, and seemed to be both uh, humble enough, but also smart enough to be able to ride the rapids, which is what any startup is. That's fantastic. Um, and thank you for uh, for shouting out. We do a week on coachability in the, my entrepreneurship class. I appreciate you looping that back in there. Um, so, uh, all right, so let's let's talk a little bit now. We've understood what Omnic is and, and the value propositions. Let's zoom out just one level um, and get to the easy questions. Like for example, what is the metaverse? Uh, and I, I ask it that way because, of course, it is so new uh, that nobody, I think if you ask 10 people, they would have 10 different definitions. Um, but uh, in terms of your own understanding, um, how would you talk about, you know, the metaverse if you were to explain to, you know, someone brand new in the space? And, and I'll field that with Sean first. Okay. Yeah. Give me the easy question right off the bat. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, I, I think this is an interesting one because you're exactly right. I think, you know, if you ask 10 different people, you get 10 different answers. Um, you know, if, if I give it through the lens that I'm looking at the world right now, um, right. Just like, just like, you know, we started to see the inklings of a few years ago where, uh, esports started on the rise and if you look at like kind of the younger demographics and stuff, they will all recognize any esports kind of personality or player or name, whereas they won't necessarily recognize an NBA star or, you know, an NHL star. And, and so it's kind of meeting this younger crowd in the world in which they live in, right? And, 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 you know, as we kind of sit here, right? Like I can't qualify myself as a digital native, even though, right, as a very, very young kid, you know, I had an Apple II computer and a Lisa, you know, in my in my house, which not a lot of kids did, right? And and um, but that still didn't make me like I didn't actually get to see, you know, what later became, you know, the internet until actually I went to school and and in college kind of started to be like oh wow we had project Athena at MIT and that was tied into ARPANET and that's what became the internet later like it, it was this it was this weird thing of of now that now everyone who grows up they don't even know what it's like to not have the internet and so I think we're seeing this transition begin to happen where just as much stuff happens online or even maybe more than happens in their traditional, you know, I guess, physical meat space, if you want to you know, refer to it in that kind of context. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you definitely saw commerce has shifted. Uh, now entertainment and, and sports are shifting. And I think more and more of that will just continue to shift. And that's kind of what I see the metaverse is kind of evolving to be. I can say 
as well that I hope it's not dominated by Facebook or Meta or whatever you know they're called now. I hope whatever it is becomes much more of a you know representation of like the, the world and society and how we would like to see it instead of one person's vision. Yeah, absolutely, and, and some great some great points there, Stephen. Is there anything particular uh, to add there? Well, I would just say that, you know, there, as with all of these things where technology and entertainment combine, you know, you can approach it for, for, for the few of us who are not nuclear physicists. The, the other way to approach this is um, where I come from, which is which is the content side and the entertainment side. And, you know, I I have no idea how a television set works. Um, but you can be in the television business and not know how a television set works. And in fact, the people who do know how television sets work very often create really boring TV shows. Yeah, that would be bad shows. <laughs> so, 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 you know, these are two halves to the same coin. Um, and, you know, I can barely understand uh, what John and Chuck talk about. But what I, I, I in terms of the technology and the artificial intelligence that's used to analyze gameplay, but I do know something fun when I see it. I do know something that appeals to an audience when I see it. Um, and I certainly know how audiences change. So what Sean said about sort of meeting the audience where it is today. Um, and, and that is particularly relevant, for instance, in sports. I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but, you know, esports has now become a collegiate thing. Um, there are a lot of schools, I'm sure NYU is one of them, um, you know, that have esports teams. And in some cases, those are even bigger in terms of the number of people, the number of students who are involved than any of the traditional sports. Um, and there's this whole interesting tug of war that happens inside colleges and universities. You know, is it part of the athletics department? Is it part of the computer science department? You know, where, where does this fit? So it's a, so to me, but the, but the key point is, that, you know, follow, follow the audience. And, and that's where people are going today. And so if you are interested in any number of areas, sports being the subject at hand, um, to me, you can't really claim to know about this business without knowing about esports today. It's just integral to both sports and entertainment, and that's why I find it so exciting. And really, really great points there. And you know what I notice or what I kind of hear the, the central theme, and I've sort of peppered you know um, my other victims with the same question. Uh, and the theme that I hear is you know. It's about immersion and it's about layering um, the digital on top of you know the physical, right? Like the first um, the first iteration of the web, and this will be brand new to any students uh, watching this. It, it was completely static, you know. It was a bunch of pages. It was like flipping through a giant encyclopedia that just happened to be on a computer screen. Um, that was like that was your web 1.0, right? And then the second iteration of the web was, hey, what if, you know, pages could link together and what if you could, you know, have a hyperlink that takes you from here to here? Uh, and what if, you know, different uh, interactions could actually update automatically on their own? And it's, it's not a static thing. It's actually something, you know, where networks can be built and, and connective, there was connective tissue, so to speak, right? And then, you know, that's what that brings me kind of to the web three idea of, you know, the the web as we know it and as you know our my students know it is has only ever been dynamic and changing and evolving and it's only ever been this fundamentally networked uh infrastructure the next level is to interweave it with um more parts of our our physical daily experience whether that is ar whether that's vr whether that's some combination of the two um i think that's going to be that's going to be the next challenge um, when it comes to the metaverse. But what's what I think is neat about where these three worlds intersect is that, you know, think about the use cases of metaverse and Web3 technologies like right now. You know, what is the most immersive thing you can do in the metaverse? And the answer is 
esports, right? I think overwhelmingly um, for the, the products that are offered right now. Um, and so I think that's why part of it is, you know, that's what's interesting to me about, you know, the role of esports uh, in this in this space. So I'm curious, um, you know, and this is this can be for for, for both of you. Um, did you notice that the the pandemic, did you get a sense that it helped accelerate all this talk and this trend towards metaverse web three or or did it um, did it actually initiate it? on its own. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it accelerated. I think it was already, I think it was already getting there, right? And, you know, from the standpoint of just, even if you look at, you know, popular science fiction writers from long ago, right, that first, like, you know, right, first coining the metaverse, right? And, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, from Neuromancer or from Snow Crash or whatever, right? Like, they all had those, those, those elements of, you know, look, th there's going to be this thing, like, especially like you said, that's this digital thing layered on top of the physical world and it's going to be there. And I think just kind of the natural evolution of some of the technologies that we've had, as well as people getting more and more familiar with doing things online. So to go back to, you know, what you were saying just a few minutes ago of, Right, like a lot of people won't real don't think or realize this, but there was a long period where people were scared to enter a credit card online to buy something. Right, like it was like, well, you're you you're working with this anonymous. How do you know they're going to ship anything? Like, what, how do you know you're going to get anything? Right, and and now that people have begun to you know, like that's very commonplace now. Right, like nobody sits there and thinks twice about well, you know should I really give Amazon a credit card or, you know, <laughs> no, okay? I know I'm, a, I know I'm a little too um, liberal with my, my credit card usage on Amazon. So <laughs> we don't have to go too far down that, yep. that wormhole, but you're absolutely right. Right. There's a, there's an expected level of trust now that people just, just have in this, this complex infrastructure. I mean, can either of you envision a world in the future where, you know, like a significant portion or, maybe even most like entertainment is consumed virtually. Like, you know, I'm thinking Oculus and, and those types of technology. Do you see, is that down the road at all? I definitely think it's there already. I, I have several friends who will, who will watch like YouTube or movies in VR because it puts them in that movie studio or in that movie theater and they don't have to go to the movie theater and listen to someone chew on, you know, popcorn or, you know, <laughs> a kid get upset and start crying or whatever, right? <laughs> They're like, yeah, it's just like I'm there. Like, I don't know that I'm not there, right? It, you know, I'm watching the movie anyway. It's not like I'm getting up and walking around, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I believe that there will always be, always be a market for scripted filmed entertainment just like there is always been a market for stories that people read their children you know cavemen told stories around the campfire there will a good story well told you know writing will always matter um so i don't think it's either or I don't think we evolve from linear to interactive. I think they're simultaneous. And as many people as watch, you know, Top Chef or The Apprentice or The uh, American Idol or The Voice, all of which are about feedback and usually embarrassing someone publicly, um, which is really fun for a lot of people. That doesn't mean that people have stopped watching movies and TV shows. And, and, and the same is true here. You know, people are not going to stop playing sports where they get out and run around on a field because they're doing esports. There will be some people who prefer even to the exclusion of the other, um, one or the other, but there will also be a lot of people who do both. Um, so I don't think it's either or, I think it's and. Um, and I think that it continues to 
um, evolve. And the basic, and this is why I love, you know, the content businesses, because the basic things in the case of Omnic, for instance, this notion of how'd I do, how'd I do, how could I do better? You know, that is a basic human urge. And it's true from the moment we first take our first step, right? Little babies love it when you give them feedback. Good job. What a good job that was, right? All the way through college students who really need to get an A on the paper, otherwise they fall apart and they have to have special office hours with their professor to figure out what did I do wrong. So um, this is this is how people are and, and, and having, and it's why I love the Omnic concept that it goes with, you know, whether you're playing Valorant or Overwatch or League or any of these things, you want to know how did I do? How could I do better? How did I do compared to someone else? What are my stats? And 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 those are the things that the this analytical AI analytical platform gives you. So that kind of leads me. Um, we there's always going to be. I, I I do happen to agree that I think there's always a going to be a space for you know scripted content and stories. Um, and as someone who's plugged in with the esports industry and trends in those spaces, you know, for, for Sean, I'm wondering, you know, right now, if you were to go to an Overwatch um, league, right, this is still something that's played, you know, on a screen, right, in, in 2D. Um, do you envision a space for, let's say, 3D based video game uh, competitions? Is that um, coming down the pike? Um, and uh, is is that something that maybe way down the road Omnic is is thinking about at least you know in the in the back of your mind? Yep, yep. Um, in fact, yeah, we've we've had we've had a couple of uh, game studios already ask us, you know, if if our engine could work like analyzing essentially VR you know games or VR worlds, and you know the the easy answer to that is yes, because once again, right, um, using these techniques of computer vision the more data we get, the better results we get, essentially, right? The more people are playing and using our tool, the better analysis we can provide to everybody else. It becomes kind of a, a you know, in a way, like a community-driven thing. Likewise, if you're in a VR world where you have a 360-degree view, that's much more information than what we look at right now on a computer screen with a 90-degree view, you know? And um, we would love to, you know, kind of see those things, you know, emerge and take hold. Mm -hmm. I do think they are a little bit more in the future, just, you know, because they've still got some things to, to work out between the whole, you know, brain and eye sync, you know, mechanism, right? And you don't want a lot of people getting sick. That doesn't help. <laughs> so, so our technology needs to be tweaked a little bit, but it's coming. It's definitely coming. I was I was surprised to to learn that recently that something like uh, you know fifteen to twenty percent of folks uh, just ocularly speaking have trouble with uh, um, with the it's, I think it's MetaQuest now not Oculus anymore but yeah uh, yeah something in the the engineering just just doesn't sit right so that's an interesting yeah. like because your eyes and, your eyes focusing like three inches in front of you but your brain thinks it's like you know ten feet in front and yeah. as soon as that starts happening your brain starts generating a chemical, right? To make you think that you ate mushrooms or something <laughs> and <laughs> wants, wants to make you sick. Yep. <laughs> right. That's, that's a whole different type of uh, metaverse there. Yep. <laughs> um, the, uh, the natural metaverse. Um, yeah, that's fantastic. So that's really interesting. Are there any technologies um, that are, that you're particularly excited about, right? You mentioned, you know, there's uh, a new yeah. breed of computer vision um, are there any other kind of like ancillary things that might mimic human behavior or human cognition or anything? Yeah, like that there, that you there's actually a, yeah, there's actually a whole suite of technologies coming out that that we're very interested in, right? Um, everything from um, right, uh, we're using the, they're called deep learning techniques, and and deep learning techniques have been around for literally, you know, maybe you know the math anyway has been around for you know, 30, 40 years without a problem. Mm -hmm. We just didn't have the computational power to do it. And now we have that computational power and it's only getting better and better and better, right? Uh, Google and NVIDIA and, 
you know, all these companies that are working on different AI solutions have started making chips that are optimized specifically to do these types of calculations. And mm -hmm. so that's super exciting. The, the better those chips that come out and the faster and more efficient we can analyze things, the more we can analyze. Mm -hmm. And I find that, you know, absolutely phenomenal. Um, I also find, you know, just data visualization techniques are getting better and better and better. Uh, the data scientists are really starting to, you know, get better tools and, and provide it. So as we get these large amounts of data, right? Like a normal human, if you look at a spreadsheet with a million lines, you don't have any idea what that says. So we have to find ways to distill it down. And there's some really cool technologies coming out that do that, right? Which is, which I find, you know, absolutely, you know, kind of fascinating. And then the last one, I think, that is going to be a little bit of a, uh, I don't know, this is a little controversial, right? But, um, you know, there's these things that have been out there that I would say have kind of been silly in their use right now. Uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, and mm -hmm. cryptocurrency type things. Mm -hmm. And you know, when people first think of those, the first thing they're thinking of is, you know, the Bored Ape Yacht Club and <laughs> stuff like that. And these, these kind of tear, like, I don't want to say terrible because every, you know, every piece of art has its admirers, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very political <laughs> answer. I don't know that anybody in here would, would argue with it. Uh, I, I mean, I mean to say that the digital uh, kittens from a couple years ago <laughs> yeah, aren't a, a serious yeah. and contributory <laughs> uh, technology. No, I, I do hear what you're saying. Though. Yeah. But, but what is fascinating with this is this is the first time, and I, I think what people don't realize is this is where it, it's kind of unique. And it's the first time in human history where you can actually, like up until now, if you had an image or a pixel or a digital representation of something on the internet, it could be copied freely and anyone had it. But now someone actually can have unique ownership of a particular digital representation. And I think that becomes really, really interesting as we start to layer on the metaverse. And there, actual, there actually is now an ownership or a commerce element associated with that. And um, you know, as an example, one reason why I think this is interesting is I mentioned that, you know, the forge generates these unique player cards. Mm. Well, when I was a kid, that was the thing is trading baseball cards, right? <laughs> and I absolutely love that. Well, now imagine if if I'm an aspiring esports gamer and you know, here I am in, you know, high school and my first card that I generate, and then later on I go on to become a pro that card could be extremely valuable someday. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting concept to work with. Yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. I think uh, a lot of the, the use cases we're seeing NFTs for now are, are experimental, you know, and, yeah. and there's a, there's going to be many, many iterations down the road and, and they're going to become, you know, their space, their, their spots in, um, in the digital ecosystem will become more crystallized. Uh, yep. So I'm excited to see where that goes too. Um, yep. Okay, so now we're, we've got about 15 minutes left here. Um, we've talked about um, Omnic and, and then we zoomed out a little bit and talked about esports and the metaverse and that whole ecosystem. I want to zoom out just one more level now uh, and talk more broadly about entrepreneurship. Uh, and, and Stephen, you may be, you know, one of the preeminent folks to talk to about entrepreneurship uh, in, in the world, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, as in terms of the, the scope of work that you've done in entrepreneurship, uh, advising, you know, presidential administrations on small business development around the world and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, what do you see as some of the biggest problems um, for the entertainment industry in the next you know, let's say seven to 10 years that could be solved through um, entrepreneurship and, and innovation? Well, first of all, thanks for the compliment. I'm definitely not sure that that's at all true, but um, I much. have, you know, I have worked in, in entrepreneurship ecosystem building in a lot of places around the world, including in the US. And, you know, I have this view that um, 
it really is about an ecosystem. It's not like one thing. So, you know, I, I, I was, uh, I was I worked at the State Department as the first senior advisor for entrepreneurship to uh, what was then Secretary Hillary Clinton and built a program that was based on this notion that for for developing countries particularly who wanted the secret sauce of American because entrepreneurship has been sort of the engine that has driven the American economy and frankly American job creation almost since the beginning. I mean, Benjamin Franklin, right? So um, it is very much in American DNA and uh, the people who are on this call, I'm sure there are lots of them, you know, who are interested in startups, probably involved in startups. New York has become a major startup center and so forth and so on. And, and one of the things I always say is it's, you know, it's not about, it's not like, you know, all you need to do is, is have a venture capital firm open an office in your town, or all you need to do is start an accelerator or an incubator, or all you need to do is start an entrepreneurship course at your school. And then all of a sudden you will have, you know, you have to do all those things and more. So it's about an ecosystem approach. And I talk about in this book that I wrote a piece through entrepreneurship, um, that, you know, there are six categories of activity and six categories of player that have to be woven together to create an ecosystem. Um, and um, the, the six categories of activity are identify, train, connect and sustain, fund, enable public policy and celebrate entrepreneurs. And the six categories of players are corporations, foundations, universities, NGOs, academia and government. And um, what you find, and, and I've been working in, in, in trying to help build the, the entrepreneurship ecosystem in my adopted home state of Maine um, since I moved there almost 15 years ago. Uh, and Maine is a great example because it, it, it could be, you know, when I first got there, it could have been a lot of places in Africa. I mean, it was very, very uh, weak ecosystem. And there are a lot of things that you know, have helped. And, and, you know, the Omnic story in a way, I mean, there's so many reasons I, I love this particular, um, you know, company, not least because it's, it, 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 it pulls together the technology and entertainment strands of my own working career of, you know, 40 plus years. But um, it also happens to be in this adopted home state that I love. And it is, a, it is to me, an example of some of the progress that we made. You know, we spent a lot of time um, trying to groom and build um, the ecosystem. Uh, the the program that through which I met Omnic um, is uh, uh, called uh, the Rue Institute, which is um, you know very heavily focused on entrepreneurship and innovation, creating an ecosystem. It's it's it, it it's run by Northeastern University. It has a a huge new presence in uh, Portland, Maine, and it provides a, a whole range of of services, including uh, traditional courses. So lots of computer science and, and data analytics and the kinds of things that, you know, Sean is, is so expert at have moved to this new institute in Portland, but it also has, you know, an incubator. It has a mentoring program, which is what I was in, which is how I met these guys. So it's very much an ecosystem approach. And, and I'm a big believer in that ecosystem approach and where you find it is where you're most likely to find, um, you know, the, 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 the most fertile field for new startups. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it does, it does strike me that, um, you know, maybe less so in entertainment because entertainment is a, a slightly older industry than like sports as, as we know it. Um, in sports in particular, that ecosystem is, is pretty nascent still. It, it's only recently started to gain some momentum um, since maybe about 2014, 15, 16. Like that stretch is when you started to see, oh, hey, look, we have incubators now that are specific for, you know, sports startups. And we have accelerators that only work on these problems in, in live sports, or we have you know, venture capital funds that are being raised for, you know, stadium tech, you know, and so it's still very new. It's still very nascent. Lots of uh, it's, it's a fertile ground for, you know, for problem solving. 
Um, as we have about eight minutes left here, I'm, I'm curious, Stephen, if you could just say real quick, um, you know, what, are, what is the next, what are some essential skills for the next generation of, of aspiring entrepreneurs that may be interested in esports or may be interested in entertainment more broadly? Well, there's no question, you know, and, and NYU is such an interesting place because NYU has a really deep, illustrious history in the arts and entertainment. Um, and, and, and like I said before, to me, the traditional storytelling skills, um, those are never going to be obsolete. Um, those are always, you know, so it's, it's, it's very much worth doing all of the old fashioned hard work about writing, editing, notes, feedback, all of that. Um, but by the same token, as, as the whole Omnic um, uh, sort of case study, if you will, demonstrates um, the marriage of technology, how technology affects the content to me is extremely interesting. And there are so many examples of this, um, you know, reality television, when it started, you know, 20 years ago, uh, and I remember vividly, because I'm old, that um, there were an awful lot of people who, you know, poo pooed this, this is not, this is not entertainment, people are not going to be interested, who wants to see a bunch of stupid people making fools of themselves, you know, trying to splash around in water or survive on some island or go on dates with some guy. And this is going to be terrible. Well, of course, of course, this is this, this, you know, for a while became sort of the, the dominant form of media. In my view, fortunately, it has sort of settled back to a more moderate level. But the fact of the matter is that, um, entertainment and technology have always influenced each other. They continue to influence each other. You know, when, when I was at Warner Brothers from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, the biggest revenue there was uh, the home video division. Most of the students who are watching this have never seen or know what a video cassette is. Um, uh, my own grandchildren, when I show them CDs, um, you know, they, they are amazed. And then I show them what a vinyl record is. And they just think that's like a, a Frisbee, so a truck ran over. So it's very, um, it's very, it changes very fast. And this group of people who are both listening to this call, but also students at a place like NYU that brings together these multiple, you know, it's one of the reasons I, I, I believe in sort of universities that have multiple pieces to them. I, I, I was a liberal arts major. I still believe liberal arts has a has a, a role, um, uh, but obviously so does technology. So I think that you're in a unique place, um, those of you who are students who are listening to this, to be able to sample the smorgasbord, the buffet that is available to you, and that I, I hope and encourage that you do sample. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's uh, that's really insightful. We always try to drive in that it's important to have a broad set of experiences and skill sets and to you know take full advantage of what the university offers. So it's, it's wonderful to hear that. Uh, we have one quick question uh, and about four minutes left. And this comes from a student of ours. Uh, and Jeff is asking, um, what do you think is, is the most exciting applications of, of AI in this space uh, moving forward? Um, maybe aside from what we've talked about so far. Yeah, no, that's, that's interesting. Um, so one of the most exciting ones I think is, uh, just kinematics in general. Mm. Um, there, there, uh, I've, I've already met now, maybe, a, I would say a half a dozen companies now, um, that are all relatively young that are doing something, uh, with kinematics, either in, you know, a, maybe a solo sport such as golf, which is a, you know, kind of what I would say is maybe the most obvious representation, right? To analyze a swing, um, mm -hmm. things like that. But also we've, we've talked with a couple of companies that have been doing it for uh, soccer and uh, basketball. Mm -hmm. And it's absolutely interesting that it's not only for an individual sport, but also they're measuring the motions of the entire team at once and mm. being able to analyze, look, if, if this is the positioning, even if you have the best, you know, pass, 
right? The other person has to be in this this body position to mm -hmm. most effectively, you know, receive that pass, that kind of thing. And I find that absolutely fascinating that we can now start to drill that to that much detail and mm -hmm. and get down to that. I, I think that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that stuff is like what we would historically call the eye test, right? Like, does this person are they comfortable on the field or the court or whatever? Are they do they are they fluid? You know, these kind of subjective terms where you can now yep. quantify that now, which is which is pretty incredible. Um, yep. I, I want to be mindful of our, our hard stop at, at six here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say thank you so much um, to to both panelists, to Sean and to Stephen for joining me. Uh, it's always a pleasure. I always learn something new uh, whenever I talk to both of these guys. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, and on behalf of all the students and the faculty here at the Tisch Institute, thank you for helping us close out our spring 2020 Chalk Talk series uh, in, a, in a sprinting through the finish line. It's strong. Oh, thank you for having us. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again. Bye.